Hi, you're welcome to the Ola Show. I am Olaumi Oye Deji. And our guest for today is a Nigerian born ace broadcaster, a voiceover artist, an economist, a marketing communication specialist, an author, a content creator, and a blogger. He recently authored the book. 100 random light bulbs. He's none other than Emmanuel Ugoli. I have so many questions for him, but when we get back from this break, we'll get to meet him in a bit. It's still the Ola Show, and the show continues in a bit. So guys, we have Emmanuel Ugoli, and we're gonna be talking about a whole lot of things. His book, for one, everything going on with him and i'm sure emmanuel is ready to gist us abi i'm excited to be with you here now thank you thank you thank you so how often do people get to tell you that you have a very fantastic voice oh how often do i get to, uh, that's embarrassing yeah i've been hearing it my whole life my whole life i got so much for modesty <laughs> it was an embarrassing thing growing up because i think my voice cracked at the age of 14 or so or, or I think I was 14 or 13 or pretty early and my, my voice really cracked. Oh. So I would have embarrassing moments where I would walk maybe to a store and I'm this high, you know, with my thick glasses and I look at the guy and I'll be, give me bread. The guy will be like, eh, 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 give me that. <laughs> you know? And the guy would be, be like, talk again. I'm like, oh my God. I say, give me bread. <laughs> you know, so. My whole life has been one phenomenon of my life. But I, I, it was an embarrassment growing up. Yeah. I had no idea I was going to end up in a profession where it would be a blessing. Yeah. Okay. So now I add to my small resume, voice actor, because I have I get paid. Yeah, you have an amazing you know? voice. And, and 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 my voice has turned out to be a, a big gift, a divine gift. Lucky you. How often do you get you know, told that you're so pretty. Oh my God. <laughs> I hear that every day. <laughs> my mirror tells me every now and then. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Okay. All right, so. So how has your journey in entertainment been? I know you were one of the premier broadcasters we had in it. We have rather in entertainment in Nigeria. And so how has that journey been so far? The truth is I feel privileged uh, there's a there's a line that was used by um, the the legendary dead young man called Green, you know. And every time I hear that line, I just smile because I know that a bunch of us relate to it differently. Mm -hmm. He goes, "You know what it is, but I knew what it was." Mm -hmm. You know, so you go, "You know what it is, but we know I know what it was." So yeah. we, the bunch of us that saw you know, the fertile land that was just not, you know, um, cultivated yet. Yeah. It's been an amazing journey to see generations of people hang on to something that seemed to have no hope, no future. You know, it looks as if, like every other thing, the government was not supporting, yeah. you know, so... Everybody from his own angle were doing their little things. Jimmy Jart was doing his thing as a DJ. I had my thing on television, you know, putting a visual face. Yeah, I remember the those days. <laughs> you know, then um, uh, Nelson Brown was doing his thing as a producer. Late OJB was doing his thing. All scattered. But eventually, we didn't realize that, you know, collectively we were building an institutionalized system that was going to be a monster. You know, and today the world respects it. They, I don't know why they call it Afro beats, though, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we started, I mean, we all started something amazing. The journey has been great. I feel blessed. I feel humbled. I feel privileged to be part of a system that has become so big. So when people talk about, oh, pioneers, and they call my name, it, it just makes me, feel, it makes me feel really, really good inside. I'm not going to lie. So... I've seen children, 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 children come out of this. You know, from, from Plantation Boys down to Star Plus, down to, you know, David Doerr and his crew. We've seen a lot of people. Some of them come and go. Some have managed to be stubborn and stay. But overall, it's just a beautiful thing for me to see what's happening. That's good. So it's safe to say you're a grandpa in the business. 
Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. If you said granddad, it would, in the picture, in the sense of painting, you've been around, yes. But if you went by almost literally saying two generations, you would still be correct. Oh, that's Heading to three or four generations. I probably have seen. I probably have seen four generations of musicians coming to come and go. You know, you know the way you had. You know we had Azados, Totwila, Plantation Boys, Remedies, Paul Play. They were one generation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Since then, I'm sure about four generations have come. Very you know. Correct. You're yeah, I agree. I agree with you. I'm. I'm that old man. I'm that old. <laughs> Okay, so let's get more personal now. How did you feel when you found out that your kidneys were failing? How did you feel? What was the first thing that came to your mind? Oh, that question, yeah. Uh, it was a sad, it's a sad thing. You know? and it's, it's, it's one of the hardest things to deal with. You know, and then in my case, very unfortunately. You see, one thing I always think is... Uh, there are some professions that you have. I insist that there should be some kind of schooling before you attempt those professions. Let me give you a good example. One of the problems Nigerian celebrities have is that a lot of them have no sense of schooling about, about, about uh, managing pride. Yeah. You know? You know, uh, putting their, their, keeping their heads down, yeah. managing stardom. So you have a literal motion kid AJ kid who moves from looking for literal bread to eat to having awesome. bank MDs, females, throwing themselves at them. Yeah. You know? So, and the arrogance and the sense of insolence is inevitable. You can't stop it. Yeah. You just, they just lose it completely. Sure. The reason I'm saying this is doctors too, the nature of what they do the fact that they have to break news to people that's not so strong. The fact that you have to, you know, interact with people who are scared to death about what you're about to say. Yeah. There should be some degree of schooling our doctor should get in the level of human empathy. You know, I don't know what they call it in psychology, but the ability to break news without breaking the person. Yeah. You know? So I was so unfortunate. You know, I was so unfortunate that the guy who broke the news to me that I had lost my kidneys, I, you know, I usually try to say his name because I don't mind saying his name, but I always forget. You know, he was in this Lagos State Uni uh, University teaching hospital. Okay. He was so cold. Oh. He was cold. He was outright nasty. He just wow. blotted it out. And I'm like, ah, so am I going to do this? And then we'll start. He said, no. It's a lifetime problem. You just have to be managing it till you die. And blah, 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 blah. And the guy just was done and he walked away. Oh, my God. So the guy just, he just cracked my entire world open in front of me, put it on the ground and stepped. So uh, for me, I had a particularly shock, rude awakening when, when I was told by the wrongest person in the world that I had lost my kidneys. It's not something you want to deal with. Many people are not... Um, Many people are not strong enough to cope with it. And, uh, I mean, a good number go out, go all out and take their lives, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You know, I happen to know one person in that situation. So wow. it's, not, it's not like the easiest news to hear. You can, you can, and you know why? It's because, it, but it gets worse when you start dealing with it. It's one thing when you're told. Mm -hmm. It's another thing when the nightmarish nature of its, you know, uh, situation starts to unfold. Because then you start to, it's like, you know, it's like you have malaria. Just picture you have malaria for a week, right? You know, the discomfort, the he constant headaches, the this, the that, you're sweating this second. You know how miserable that one week is? Yeah. So picture someone living like that for six years. Well, that's crazy. And then you're in and out of the hospital and then you're, you're having surgeries most of the time. You're avoiding complications, avoiding infections, avoiding taking care of all kinds of business. And then of course, there's the regular dialysis, which is a must. You must go to the hospital. Like at this point right now, with this whole COVID madness, you know, nobody wants to go to the hospital. Yeah. In fact, the hospital calls you to say, don't come. Yeah. You know, they have, they, I mean, I have a few appointments that, I, that were canceled because the policy of John Hopkins Hospital is that you cannot come in right now. If you can do a video, you know, call, we'll look at you. But in the absence of that, 
they would uh, rather have you do a video call and uh, reschedule so the madness is over. But in the case of a dialysis patient, you have no choice. You have to go to the hospital three times a week. Whoa. So imagine the phobia of going to the place where they say is the easiest place to get the COVID-19. Yeah. <laughs> you go on Monday, you go on Wednesday, you go on Friday. So it's a peculiarity. And don't forget that almost every, in fact, 98% yeah. of the people who have dialysis or who have kidney problems already fall into the um, category of people yeah. who are referred to as high risk. Yeah. You know, so the chances that you would make it, if you caught it, will be, will be pretty low. Yeah. Because you already have respiratory issues, high blood pressure, diabetes, <clears throat> and all the other things that a lot of people can deal with, you know. So, so imagine being high risk and going to the hospital three times a week. Mm -hmm. It's just not fun. So, if anybody said to you that um, being a, dealing with kidney failure, they call it a chronic kidney disease, is a joke, the person is lying. You have to be unusually mentally strong, emotionally stable, and in fact, physically, you have to fight hard not to be broken down with your body all the time. Wow. You know, so it hasn't been the easiest journey from the start to now, but we have quite a success story to tell eventually. Yeah, true. So how are you able to be positive in all of this and still keep a cheerful countenance? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a decision. Uh, Ola. It's, it's, you have to, it's a decision you have to make. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it, didn't happen, it didn't happen overnight. I mean, I probably, I probably dealt with a year or two of you know, chronic depression. You know. But at one point, you have to choose Indecision can be a problem for most of us. We probably don't progress as much as we can because we haven't sat down to make that decision to do this. I don't know if you, I don't know if you, I don't know if you're how much of a hip hop fan you are. If you remember the title of um, um, Fifty Cent's album that that was called uh, "Get Rich or Die Trying." Yeah, I remember. Exactly. That. So it's, it's that mentality. Like, listen. It's, I get this thing done or I'm out like that. No problem if I go out like that, you know? So I think that's the, that's the ideology and the mentality that has driven me so strongly. I have just got into this thing from day one, uh, trying my best to understand it. But when I got to that point when I accepted it, acceptance. Yeah. Acceptance. It's not easy to accept that, the, man, this is my life now. This is what I have to deal with now. Yeah. You know, especially for someone who was who I was, everyone, up, up, doing TV, doing this, doing that, up and going. Yeah. And then there's a certain slowdown, you know, there's a certain massive constant gallop in your smooth, earlier smooth movement. It's not, yeah. it's not the easiest thing to deal with, but to answer your question correctly, it's a personal decision to, to fight it successfully. Mm -hmm. You know, I decided that I can beat it, I will beat it, and that's where I'm headed. You know, I'm headed to the second this whole madness is over, I'm I'm due for a final surgery, which would be a transplant itself, you oh. know? Yeah. So you can imagine how I would come out of that place after seven years and being told that the damn thing is You overcame. You come out like a boss, like you overcame everything. <laughs>Yeah, so that's it. I'm, I bid it because I've been determined to bid it. One, because I have a support system that's amazing. I have family that is just incredible. Mm -hmm. Then I have some friends that are stubborn to the bone with love for me. A good number of them are in my entertainment industry. A good number of them are from my childhood. I just realized how much I mean to a lot of people when this thing went south, you know. People rose, a lot of people rose. I have friends who would, look, they don't want to even hear that I call their names before they show up. You know, you cough and sound like you called Emmanuel, they'll be all up in your face. You know, so um, uh, a support system, a personal decision to beat this thing. And ultimately, ultimately, and I'm not saying this because I'm a, fan, I'm a fanatic, I'm not saying this because of any other reason, but the fact that it's a reality. I'm one of those who believes very strongly in God's power. Yeah. And I know 
that in the absence of his particular interest in me, mm. I'll have been there. You know, do you know how many people yeah. who are my friends? Who... How did you how did you feel when you heard that? I know I know the likes of Nomolos and OJB were your good friends <clears throat> and they were Nomolos was with you at the beginning and he was one of the people that tried to help. So how did you feel when you heard of his passing? It gets, it gets deeper than, than Nominus, uh, OJB, and uh, Charles, Charles, yeah. Charles B. Um, yeah. You know, these were my friends. Well, let me just stick to, you know, OJB and Charles B, for example. These were my friends. Yeah. We were dealing with the same situation. And then they didn't, at the time, at the time I had, I had tubes put in my neck. I was having dialysis there at the neck because wow. I couldn't find veins to run in any other part of my body but this very sensitive part of my neck right here. Mm -hmm. And so I had complications that were worse than theirs. Wow. So the fact that they would sign out, it was like I was on death row. Mm -hmm. You know? And then, of course, there was uh, Muna, the actor, too, who had it. And, I mean, he had a hard time trying to understand what his new life was supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. and he just couldn't relate. You know, so how I felt like losing those people, and like I said, it gets deeper because um, I I have I have built, I have been to dialysis in, in, a, in a good number of places, and in those places, I spent years building friendships with different people, okay. predominantly patients, because I mean, you can't help but become close to someone when you spend all this time together, four hours, three times a week, twelve hours of the week, we're lying down next to each other. You know, we'll talk and talk, we'll wow. buy food together, we'll sleep off, we'll get up, we'll laugh. So imagine three years of that kind of bonding mm -hmm. and then you just come one day for dialysis and the nurses can't look you in the face because they know how close you are to this guy mm -hmm. and they, didn't, they don't know how to let you know he passed on yesterday. Whoa. And I have dealt with that too many times. Whoa. You know, so it started becoming hard for me to, when they get new patients come around, I'm, I try not to be attached because mm -hmm. I couldn't explain how I could take someone's number off my phone again. The other day I was driving, you know, after I lost a friend, his name was a little friend, his name was Emmanuel too. I was driving to the center. This was in Nigeria, Victoria Island. I was coming from my house in Lekki and I was so hungry. I wanted to tell him to buy bread and akara, you know, that I would stop over and get some, you know, drinks and everything. And that was it. I had already picked up the phone. I was about to dial his number when I just remembered I was told two days ago that he was there. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, it's, it's, it's a weird thing. I have a, at my last count, I'm looking at maybe 25, 30 people that I've known personally, became friends with, and they're just no more. Wow. You know, so if you ask me how I felt when, Nomalus, uh, when OJB died, it was tough. But it's been worse than that. So I'm just looking, and then that's why I dedicated myself to a large extent to be there for people who, like, I'm not, you can see me talking so freely about the deepest things concerning my health right now. It was a deliberate decision. I'm not a very public person when it comes to private stuff. You know, I was telling you earlier how I don't talk about my real personal life publicly. Yeah. But this was a decision that I made because I realized how being open and honest and, and, and inspiring about it can be helpful to people. Yeah, very true. Yeah, yeah, so when I noticed that, I'm like, because I read, um, it was a day that I saw some guy sent me a mail about not committing suicide because of what I put on a post in, on Instagram. Wow. That was it. That was a day. I don't care if only three people read what I write for. If it's going to inspire somebody and I'm going to be the reason why you would not give up, yeah. I will constantly use my story to make people, you know, be strengthened and have the, the hope in themselves that they can beat anything. You know what I mean? That's really good. That's awesome. So one of the things you talked about in your book is managing scandal. And I know that you've had to go through that process, especially at the beginning when all of this happened. I know people had so many various things to say. How did you personally manage the scandal? Um, you see, people would say all sorts. I mean, I mean, there was one time when I was even, they even said that I, that I wasn't sick. I was just trying to raise money for myself. 
wow. you know, um, all kinds of silly talk. In fact, there was a day, some young man, um, I don't know, he came on my page or he came on, a, you know, because most of the blogs carried it on a regular. Yeah. And when they carry these things that, you know, people will come and say all sorts. But at that time, there's something I have learned. Mm -hmm. it, it, I don't know if you've seen this viral, um, this viral saying about, about proverbs from uh, Wari land. Um, there's this viral thing going around where, where they, they're spreading when, uh, Wari proverbs, right? Okay. There was one I saw that struck me. It said, um, now person will never get problem, they pray for English. <laughs> okay. Your problem is never strong. That's why you see they play for English language. Mm. Once your problem change gear, like once your once it gets hard, you will father, you will call your his name in your languages, and you see, I was facing debt. Mm. You know, I had big fishes to fry. Yeah. When you deal with stuff that is really important, you will find out how nonsensically immature it is to worry about who's saying what. Mm -hmm. So I just got to that point where I was talking to doctors regularly about, hey, listen, this, this is the possibility, this might happen. And you get a feeling that, okay, you know what, truth is this guy just said to me, I might not come out of this theater. Wow. And that's more important to me than some, you know, who I mean, like it, it really didn't matter, and I like that situation. I like because I've never been through anything like that once in my health. You know, yeah. I mean, I did almost twenty years, totally scandal-free in the entertainment industry. Well, let's say about fourteen before I took a break for telco. Um, uh, yeah, about no, about about five before I took a break for telco. But even in that, I had no issues. So it was this health thing that you know. So when that happened to me. Um, I like what it did to me. Mm. What it did to me was that it made my, oh, my skin. I mean, forget the freshness you see. Mm. It feels like, on the inside, it feels like a croc skin, you mm. know. It feels like a crocodile skin. I am so thickened. I don't, it does, see, it's like it doesn't, the older you get, the more you would understand what I mean. Ola, let me tell you something. You'll be shocked at how many things have been said about you that, that you've never heard about. I can imagine. You'll be surprised about how many. In fact, if you read the Bible itself, forgive me, I'm very What's prone up? to quoting things from the Bible. Why? As a part of the Bible, I think it's in Jeremiah, it very clearly states that this is God warning. Do not keep your ears down to everything that is said about you. Mm -hmm. For you would indeed hear your own servant call down evil upon you. This is someone that feeds because of your mercy. Yeah. That's true. You know, so left to the human tongue and its ability to waggle in the presence of ignorance, sometimes fueled by the likes of envy and total stupidity. And you, would be, you would be worse with your IQ, with your mentality. You would be worse to be the one who has a heap full of stones, mm. throwing them at every dog that backs on your way to where you're going to. You're sure you will never get there. You'll be exhausted from throwing stones. Yeah, and be rest assured the dogs will keep barking. They will bark for the rest of your life. I don't care how good you think you are, what you think you've done, how many people you've been there for. The truth is somebody somewhere every day would say something either unkind, untrue, or outright scandalous about you. You know what I mean? So you have to, like I made up my mind about my health, uh, I'm also happy that amongst the things I've made up my mind about in this life is I, I, truly, I truly don't care what anybody has to say. Yeah. You know you know who you are. You know how hard you have worked. You know how good you've tried to be. You know, so my mentality is one that says um, if it matters, uh, you would talk about it with the people that count. Yeah. If it doesn't, then the people who talk about it do not count. So you just launched your book, 100 Random Light Bulbs. What exactly inspired that? It's a collection of musings, musings that I've written over time. Like, okay. I'm the kind of person who's prone to be hit by a lesson and write it down, okay. you know? And then I'm very quick to, by my nature, extract lessons from things that happen. It's been like that for me from my teen years, you know? So 
And then I realized that every time I expressed what I thought about the lesson in this thing, people took it seriously. People loved it. So in 20, 2009 or 8, I can't remember when I joined Facebook, every once in a while, I would simply just make a quick commentary about something that I saw. And I used to be amazed at the response. So what I began to do was that I began to write some of these things and keep them down. I just write them and keep them down. So, and every day people would say to me, oh, how I wish I could read this again. Oh, I've recorded this thing. I've saved it. Oh, I did a screenshot. I'm like, you know what? Why don't I just put this thing on in a book and make sure everybody gets to, you know, have a collection of it. So you know what I would do? I'm going to write the best hundred that I've put together, the best hundred I've ever written. And I would, you know, push it out as a, as a volume in a book. So I put, I ran through all of my social media. I looked for all the things I scribbled ever, the ones I saved on my, on my email. And I came together and I think I had about 73 or 74 of them. So I'm like, okay, maybe I should make this 100. I wanted to do 50, but let me do 100. So I sat up and I completed the extra 25. So now I put it in a book. Now, each of these sayings, or rather musings, have no connection to each other. Okay. They are random things from, you know, how to cope with an ex-girlfriend to, <laughs> to, to, to what attitude you should have towards slander, yeah. to how to put your head up when things are down, yeah. to um, well, practically everything, how not to be, how not to overrate materialism. So uh, as they hit me, and as I see these deep truths that people try to run away from, I write them down and I put them together. So because there are a hundred, the first two words, a hundred, they're random. So you get the hundred random. Wow. Now they're light bulbs because the first thing I notice from everybody that reads it be like, oh, oh you know, that's just, moment. it was the most uniform response I got from everybody was as if something went off in their heads, mm. you know, as if, you know, they had like an aha moment when they were reading it. So, so I simply did say, I think the best name for this book would be a hundred random, random light, light bulbs. Fantastic. And you've done a fantastic job with the book. Well done. Okay. I would love to continue this conversation. However, our 30 minutes is, is up. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Emmanuel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I've said some things to you that I haven't said to anybody, so oh. you're welcome. You are super <laughs> <laughs> you are super welcome, and I'm very proud of what you do. Thank you so much. So, guys, it's been the Ola Show. Till next time, bye for now.